Praise be to the Lord, to God our Savior, who daily bears our burdens, Psalm 68, 19. We don't have to bear our burdens. We can always give them to the Lord. School starts this week. Can we all just have a moment of silence? <laughs>
Two years he had called her every month and said, Lisa, are you walking yet? Lisa, are you walking yet? But he talked about the persistence and the power of prayer. And I love when I feel like God's speaking to me because I had this sort of, I had this little planned out because of back to school. And then I went there and I heard that message and I saw how the two work together. We don't have to carry our burdens. We can give them to the Lord. And she had that burden for seven years, and he relieved her of it. And it was just a wonderful, powerful message for me and for us that we can give our burdens to the Lord. Good evening. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I have something I've been sort of looking at this week. I'd like to try to share with you all this morning. There's a lot of comparison of Jesus being a shepherd and us being sheep in the Bible. And I don't know if you've ever sat down and really considered what that means for us. And this morning I want to attempt to try to help us understand something in the significance of this comparison made. In the 10th chapter of John in the 14th verse, Jesus said, I am a good shepherd and know my sheep and am known of mine. And I wonder, I wonder a lot of things. <laughs> but I got to thinking about that, about the sheep and the shepherds. And come to find out, I don't really know anything about sheep. And really don't know anything about shepherds. So I got to study and I, I know more than I did and I'd like to share that with you this morning that because what I saw was just, just great. <clears throat> if you don't know anything about sheep, they, they have no sense of direction. They'll walk off in a hole. And all these things are going to be very similar if you consider ourselves as the sheep. We don't have no good sense of direction. Apart from the guidance of the Spirit, We'll walk off in a hole. And I have. And I feel like if everyone was honest, they might say they have as well. Sheep are defenseless. And I believe we're the same in this sense, in this world. On our own, we don't. We're defenseless. Another thing I found out about sheep is if a sheep falls on its back like a turtle, it can't get up on its own. It'll lay there on its back, kicking its legs in the air. And I thought, how many times have any of us been laying on our back with your legs kicking up in the air because of our lack of direction, because we walked off in a hole, only for the good shepherd to come and stand us back upright? Sheep are not meant to carry burdens. I've never seen a sheep with a saddle on its back. There's a lot of animals we use to push and pull and move and do things, but I believe we're the same in this sense. We're not meant to carry the burdens. We can't carry the burdens of this world. Another is sheep settle for bliss. As we pull all these other things added up, sheep can be on the way to clean, still waters, thirsty, and get within a few feet and run across a mud hole instead, and they'll stop and drink that nasty water. And I don't know if I can explain how we're the same in the sense, but I believe we are. And sheep can't take care of themselves when they're hurt. It takes the shepherd to do that. But I didn't want to stand up here and just talk about sheep. But I'm trying to get to a point, and what I want to share with you is the, the significance of the good shepherd this morning. And I want to go to a familiar spot. In the 23rd Psalm, down in the 5th verse, I'm just going to read the whole verse. Thou preparest the table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. I want to look at this word, anoint. I did a little studying on it this week. And there's, I don't believe I can scratch the surface of the significance on this word anoint found out that the word Christ can literally be translated back to 
the anointed one, the anointed son of God. And it's more of a title than a name. But here in this context, and we could say, I would I would say Brother Mike has been anointed, as in chosen, has been set before us by God to preach his word unto his people. King David was anointed as king. He was appointed, he was chosen, he was set in a position. But I believe this word anointing here is more in the form of a verb, as if you would pour oil on something, smear oil on something. And this is the part I want to try to get to. If you read the whole psalm, you're going to see lots of comparisons between a sheep and a shepherd, meaning us and our good shepherd. And this is the part that I learned this week that I thought was certainly worth trying to share with everyone. The reason a shepherd would pour this oil on a sheep's head, I have three different things. One of them was bugs. Apparently, sheep have a huge problem with bugs. And the shepherd would take and dump this oil all over the sheep's head. And particularly, the worst bug is a particular fly that would actually go up a sheep's nose and if it got far enough in its head, it would actually lay eggs and would cause the sheep a ton of distress, confusion, and they would bang their heads on the ground. They could even kill themselves from this flood. And I hope I can I hope I can put this forth that it makes sense to you as it did to me. But I don't know about all of you, if you have bugs flying around in your head all day that irritating thoughts or whatever it is, sinful thoughts, bad things, just from anything. You don't have to walk far, far out the door for any of this stuff to happen. And the thought here is that just like with these bugs, that if they burrow deep enough in the sheep's head, they will eventually destroy them. I thought these sinful thoughts are the same with us. And I saw the significance in the shepherd anointing the head of the sheep with oil and us bringing the shepherd all these irritations, the, not the bugs, but all the stuff in the world that you might would call something that would be harmful to your mind. And the next one is, is actually button heads. The sheep would actually butt heads. So if you've ever saw any animals that are herd animals, even our chickens, they fight. They butt heads for dominance. And I don't think this one's hard to try to assume God's people in this position. If, uh, I think we've always put it is, and we probably will for some time. But the shepherd would put this oil on the sheep's head so when they did butt heads, they would slide it off. It wouldn't hurt it bad. It wouldn't cut it and wound each other so bad. And I thought the same here. The anointing on our heads, I believe it's the reason that we can agree to disagree, that we can have our differences and still love each other, that we can have our differences and still fellowship. I believe it's the reason that by the power of the Holy Spirit, we can let brotherly love continue. And the last one I got is cuts, cuts and wounds. <laughs> You're a lot better than that. Than I am. <laughs> but these sheep out of the pasture, I'm sure all y'all have walked around barefooted in a pasture before. There's rocks, there's stickers, there's briars, there's sticks, there's holes, all kinds of stuff to get hurt on and cut on and bruised. And I thought out here in the world it's the same for us. Anywhere you walk through, you're, everything's dangerous everywhere you go. Not just physically, but spiritually and mentally. And I thought here, what I considered is the same way the shepherd would anoint the wounds of the sheep. I believe our good shepherd does the same for us. He cares about our hurt. And Jesus is attentive to our wounds. And I don't know that I've got all this out or not, but uh, I hope in any of this, if, if you haven't seen nothing else, I hope you just see that 
privilege it is to call Jesus the good shepherd. And that's about all I have on it. My prayer in this that our affection would be stirred and our hearts would be more grateful to be in the position we're in. Amen. That was worth being here for. That was worth being here for. And I particularly can consider that it's not just a question of things that irritate us. That's a problem enough. But when we allow those things to find a lodging place and start multiplying, that, that, was, that, was, that was good, brother. That was good. I thank God for it. Thank God he blessed me to hear. So I'm going to call your attention for just a few minutes now to the second chapter of the book of Acts. Beginning with the first verse, Acts 2 and 1. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, and it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. <clears throat> and when the day of Pentecost was fully come, how many Pentecosts, do you suppose, had been celebrated by that time. Pentecost started after the death angel passed over the where the doorposts were struck and with, with, with the blood of the Lamb. And God established for them this celebration this feast they called Pentecost, this solemn assembly, this solemn Sabbath that they called Pentecost. And surely there had been a number of Pentecosts that had come and gone prior to this time. But this one was different. All of the other days of Pentecost that they had celebrated, that they had enjoyed, that they had kept, that they had observed with solemn feasts and, and, and assembling together and having fellowship with one another and, and partaking of the things that God had, had decreed that they should do under the law. This Pentecost was different because this day, Pentecost had fully come. This day, this Pentecost, everything that had been prophesied of and pointed to up to that point of the coming of the Comforter, of the giving of the Holy Spirit, of the revelation and the power of God dwelling in and upon his people, this day, all of that that had been foreshadowed by the law had fully come. This day, Pentecost, had a greater depth of meaning and a greater depth of power in it than they had ever witnessed or been participants in before. And part of that was this. We find that you, 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 you go back and you read when Jesus began to tell them that, that he would send them another comforter who would be with them forever. 
And then Jesus, in essence, tells them just a few verses beyond that. that he, he said, I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. You see, I believe that what he was instructing us was this, that whenever Pentecost had fully come, whenever the Holy Spirit of God had fully fallen upon us, what Jesus was saying was, that is my power that has come unto you. I have come unto you. I have visited you. I have taken up my abode with you. I have entered my Father's kingdom to participate of it anew and afresh in a way that he did not at, but at the time that he was here in the body of flesh. <clears throat> he could be here one minute and somewhere else the next, it seemed like. But you notice he was never in two places at once. When he was here in a body of flesh, they never saw him in two places at once. He was never he never occupied multiple locations while he was here under the law. But once the law had been fulfilled and Pentecost had fully come, now in the person of the Holy Ghost, he certainly occupies. And that's, that's a wonderful thing for us, a wonderful thing to us and should be, that we can beg God for his holy presence to be with us, for his spirit to overshadow us, for his power to dwell in us and grant us the grace to see and to understand and speak of things that are too great for us to know otherwise. And I don't have to worry about because I do, because I begged Jesus to come here that the folks down the road are going to have to be without him. That he has the same power everywhere that people assemble to call upon his name, to dwell with them and overshadow them and empower them to give him praise and honor and glory. That neither time nor space nor distance nor any, anything, no, there is no wall that is a limit or a barrier to him. And he can just as easily be here and be down the road at the next place where there are those that are going to call his name as he could be to be in just one place when he was here in the body of flesh. So the day of Pentecost was fully come. And we tend to think of that sometimes, even then, even that, we, we tend to think about it sometimes as, as an isolated event. And some of what took place there, certainly, we have not seen take place in the same fashion. But I'll never forget one time my dad making the statement, the Bible says that Pentecost full, is fully come. He said, I don't find anywhere in the Bible after that that it says that it's fully gone. Pentecost had fully come. Pentecost was not just a, a, a law feast anymore. Pentecost was a place where God had called his people to dwell in the power of his spirit under the unction of the Holy Ghost where he had promised, I will not leave you comfortless. I will come unto you. I will send the Holy Comforter unto you and he will tell you all the things of mine. There's a beautiful lesson here when Pentecost had fully come. They were all with one accord in one place. Pentecost is not a place of division. Pentecost is not a, is, is not a place of, of button heads to do damage. And we, we've seen plenty of that in our lifetime. More than I ever wanted to see. Of God's people. Tearing and biting and, 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 and hurting one another to the point that, that, that congregations have been destroyed by it. But Pentecost, fully come, is evidence because we are in one accord 
in one place. We have one goal, one desire, one mind, one purpose, and that is all focused on worshiping and honoring and glorifying the God of heaven and earth who has called us, separated us, given us a Redeemer that we might praise Him freely and fully. And it comes suddenly. It still comes suddenly. Whenever you sat down, whenever the, the first time that you actually heard the preaching of the gospel, I'm not talking about the first time you sat in church and heard some man stand up here God. But the first time that you heard in your heart that you felt and understood in your soul the preaching of the gospel. Did it take days for it to get there? It was surprising, wasn't it? That whereas you might have sat in church for days or weeks or months or sometimes years and it was kind of like the teacher on the top of the and all you were here was womp, 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 womp. And all of a sudden, there was a language there that touched you in a way that you never imagined you could be touched with a power that you had never dreamed of in your life and liberated you in ways that you could not have comprehended before and convicted you in ways that you had never been convicted before and suddenly your whole life was different. Suddenly. Now God is faithful. The scripture tells us he that hath begun a good work and you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. So, I mean, it, I, I'm not saying that, that you know, uh, it's always a sudden thing. We, we I'm, I'm sure it felt sudden to Paul. But you, you need to stop and understand that, that when he was smitten on the road to Damascus, whenever he began to share his testimony about that, he was careful to point out that before that, when he was going down the road, um, on the road to Damascus with papers to chain these people that were foolish enough to call on the name of Jesus, he said, I barely thought I did God's service. Paul did not see originally that he was persecuting God's people. He, in his mind, according to the law that he was raised under and the things that he was taught and, 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 the, and the belief system that he held, he was doing the right thing. What I'm saying is that Paul had known about God for a long time. He said he was a Pharisee of the Pharisees. Well, the Pharisees considered themselves to be the most strict sect of the Jews that there was. That they, they kept the law, but they made sure that, that, they didn't, that, that they didn't step out of line anywhere. Self-righteous much, yes. But they were bound and determined to keep the law. And Paul said, not only was I a Pharisee, but I was a Pharisee of the Pharisees. Paul said other Pharisees just thought they were Pharisees. I was, I was something. And he proved it. <laughs> like most of us. But he had an experience of grace that came upon him suddenly. He's headed down the road to Damascus, got all his servants, got his papers in his hand, is bound and determined that he's on the right track doing the right thing, and all of a sudden there was this great light, and there was this big noise, and the servants that were with him said it thundered. But Paul knew better. He was struck down. Now, I assure you, that God doesn't have to knock us all down. Some of us, he may. He knows exactly how much pressure it's going to take to get our attention. He said to Peter, come follow me. That was enough. 
He had to knock Paul down. Blinded him by the light of his glory. <coughs> now, Paul still had some things to learn, didn't he? <coughs> but something, something had happened to Paul that he knew that whoever, that, that what had happened was a power that he had not yet experienced. And his question was, who art thou, Lord? He didn't know what to call it, but he knew he was Lord. He knew he was his master. He knew that he had the power and the authority and the control over him. And who art thou, Lord? I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. Paul, it's hard for thee to know at that time they called him Saul. It's hard for thee to kick against the bridge. The Spirit of God can be seen a very sudden thing in our lives. I believe that's what he meant when he said in the scriptures, I was found of them that sought me not. When, when, when you found me, you really weren't looking for me. You just you didn't know you didn't know you needed me. <laughs> Until you found me. You found me when I revealed myself to you. There came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire, and it sat upon each of them. See, that's another wonderful thing about the coming of the Spirit. It can fill the house, and yet it's felt as an individual thing as cloven tongues of fire sat upon each of them. That mighty rush, that sound of a mighty rushing wind, it filled the house, and yet it touched each of them. Such is the power and the glory of being together in one accord in the Lord, of having the mind of Christ, that it is something that we have fellowship together in, and at the same time, it's something that each of us feels individually, that this is God's gift to you, God's visitation to you, the visitation of your Word and Savior, Jesus Christ, to you. Just as everything else has been. Everything that He did covered a great host and yet at the same time he knew every individual covered touched protected moved changed by what he was doing and by what he had promised and by what he had fulfilled and all that he had accomplished and so while the Holy Spirit was filling the house where they were, that it, that it rested, at the same time it rested upon each of them as individuals. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now I know that there's a whole lot of a lot of different ideas around this thing of speaking in other tongues. And certainly as Brother Gary and I had a little short discussion the other day, uh, in some of Paul's writings, Paul's writings seem to indicate, in, in this particular instance, it seems to indicate later on that, that they were simply speaking in other known languages that were not their native tongue. But Paul also writes in a way that, that seems to indicate that there was a speaking in tongues that, had no, that, that was not any known language to man, that it was speaking only to God. And he set particular parameters around that. But what I want you to see this morning, what I would that God would grant us the grace to understand this morning, that whenever the Holy Ghost comes into our lives and the Holy Spirit rests and abide upon us, we speak with other tongues as the Spirit gives us utterance. You see, 
I know from his own testimony, there was a time in his life that Brother Robin would not have stood up here and said to you the things he said this morning. Compared to where he might once have been, what he had to say this morning was another tongue. It was another language altogether. Each and every one of us have experienced that. That it's another language altogether. That we speak of things that with the flesh we could not know. That we talk of things that as men and women in this world, they are too great for us. That we speak with assurance and with, with certainty that Jesus died on the cross. That he rules and reigns and that he blesses our lives from the least to the greatest. Don't think that God's not blessing these babies in being here. And I stress to you again, as, as parents, as parents, I'll never tell you you can't use the nursery. But I will tell all of you this. There is no scriptural example that Jesus ever left us for separating our children from the congregation of worship. Personally, if I can't find a reason, if Jesus didn't give me a reason to do it, I generally found out in my life that I'm better off not to. And to trust him, to put my confidence in him, my hope in him with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. You see, whenever we are able to speak kindly to one another, whenever we are able to encourage one another, whenever we are able to testify and witness to other people that God is real in our lives and that He is good and that He is merciful and that He has power and that He hears our prayers and that He has done all of these wondrous and, and, and mighty and, and, all, and unbelievable things for us and in us, I'll assure you this. You didn't just wake up one morning and decide you were going to tell people that. The Spirit gave them utterance. Whenever you find yourself speaking in love and mercy and kindness and encouragement, <coughs> To God's people. Whenever you find yourself uttering truth to men without being embarrassed by it, without worrying about how they're going to receive it or what they're going to think about it or what they're going to do with it. As, as, as preachers, that was one of the that was one of the hardest things that that, that I had to get through my head early on in life was. It, it, it's, not, it's not my responsibility what people do with the gospel of Jesus Christ when they walk out of the building. I wasn't called to change your life. I was called to preach to you the gospel. That's my job. And I become more and more thankful for that every day of my life. That by his grace and mercy, I get to stand in places like this and tell people that, you know, I, I may not know what God is to you. I, I'm not going to, I won't stand and tell you what God's going to do in your life. I'll tell you what he's done in mine. I'll tell you what a difference he has made in mine. I'll tell you how glorious his presence has been in mine. I can t I'll tell you why that I am convinced that he has had his hand in my life and that he has made a difference in my life. And I can tell you that without being afraid, uh, 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 without worrying about whether or not you think I am absolutely crazy. Because the Spirit is utter. 
when the day of Pentecost was fully come. Child of God, we should rejoice in that simple truth that that day was different from all the other times that Pentecost had come. And that that day is fully come. And that we are still to this day reaping the benefit and the joy and the blessing of that day. May God bless us to live in a Pentecost that is fully come. God bless and keep you.